What was Bride Joan doing out on the town? Can Emmanuel go to the hoop with the big boys? Why does Gene Hackman remind Matt Dillon of his dad? Is Hackman in so many movies he has to bring his lunch? Entertainment Tonight checks the media's royal treatment for Monday, November 11th, 1985. Oh, it's great. <laughs> I'm Rob Weller. And I'm Mary Hart. The last two episodes of North and South won handily in the 12 Market Nielsen Overnights. Saturday night, the ABC special won with an average rating of 21.6. The final episode Sunday night won with an average of 26.3. And the premiere show of Saturday Night Live with its new cast also did well. It won its time period with a rating of 11.9 and a 33% share of the audience. Washington, D.C.'s media mania over royalty turned out to be a Don to Dusk ordeal for many and perfect pictures, but for a few. Peter Quinn Hackus reports. Sunrise at Andrews Air Force Base. That's when and where most reporters picked up the royal visit story. And as they followed the prince and princess around the sights of D.C., folks like KGTV San Diego's Adrian Alpert got the hang of a story that was not only light on substance, but heavy on coverage obstacles. This is the moment that everyone really waits for, the arrival. Aside from departures, it's just about the only opportunity that most of the press have of getting their own pictures. These comings and goings also provided the rare opportunity to elicit a royal quote. Please, back into the briefing room. But when you weren't invited in, a single network camera provided video, a single reporter kept track of the important details. White shawl collar worn over a white camisole. What kind of white collar? White oh. shawl. S-H-A-W-L. Okay. A cozy White House get-together Saturday night offered promise of new texture to the story, but most of the stars got away with short answers to short questions, like, why were you invited? I have no idea. I have no idea. I would be very glad. If I'm asked to, I'll be happy. more for the story? Well, you can always interview the crowd, which in efforts to get its own glimpses, gave the press no quarter. They hope there's not only lines here, but at J.C. Penney's as well. And when stand-ups were all done and the crew's been pulled to go back home a day early, time to reflect. Was it a royal pain? Well, the California angle was a little hard to find, but I think the local angle of just sort of being tourists here as opposed to trying to be Sam Donaldson covering something. Yeah, um, yeah. We just, uh, you know, Mr. and Mrs. Smith go to Washington. We just try to do it the best we could. In Washington, Peter Quinn Hackis, Entertainment Tonight. All the celebrities weren't in Washington, D.C. over the weekend, not by a long shot. Here are three reports on the goings-on in Los Angeles. Not everyone was partying in Washington with Prince Charles and Princess Diana. Some very important people were at the Beverly Hilton to honor Gene Kelly with the Friars Club Life Achievement Award. But would they rather have been in Washington? I was invited to Washington. <laughs> Where is their party? In Washington. Oh, in Washington. Oh, in Washington. Oh, that's right. Oh, yeah. yeah. That one. Yeah, that one. Oh, that Charles and Diana. <laughs> oh, I got it. <laughs> I wish I could have been there tonight. There's no denying it. They're so beautiful. But Gene is gorgeous. He's sure a nice substitute, isn't he? Do you feel like this town treats you like royalty? Well, I love that analogy. They always treat me very nicely, but... Nobody's bowing or scraping. <laughs> Gene Wolfe, Entertainment Tonight. Many Hollywood notables took part in a tribute for the Simon Wiesenthal Center, the organization dedicated to keeping the memory of the atrocities in Germany alive. This was the theme of Wiesenthal's 1981 Oscar-winning documentary. Listen well, my friend. What you are about to hear and see is a true story. Believe me. It can happen again. The main reason the center exists is that man can still inflict cruelty on his fellow man. 
with this organization, it does make us look back to make certain that it's never, ever going to happen again. It's something that, like most terrific events in history, seem to pass away slowly, constantly. It's amazing how forgiving we are as people, and I, I never want this to be forgiven. Please, don't believe all this nonsense about the Holocaust didn't exist. It did. Al Owens, Entertainment Tonight. Richard Pryor announced the winner of this year's Scott Newman Award, an honor given to the television program that does the most to show the prevention of drug abuse. The winner of the 1985 Scott Newman Award is an episode of The Adventures of Fat Albert, entitled The Runner. <laughs> Looks like there are more ways to go flying than in a rocket. Trouble is, Lewis's space capsule is a drug capsule, and that's no good. Well, I'd just like to say, ladies and gentlemen, to you that you should feel good about what you're doing tonight. You really are helping people. This year, 43 TV programs emphasizing the prevention of drug abuse were entered in the Scott Newman competition, almost doubling the number of entries last year. But does that mean networks kept promises they would not glorify the use of drugs on TV? All the TV shows would just about go off the air without drug abuse of one kind or other being glamorized, I, I fear. So I think they can take a responsible view of it, but I don't think they can stamp it out completely. This year I have not seen anything that I felt that way about. I think they've done a good job. So they've lived up to their promise? I believe so, yes. Drugs create a whole, for TV shows, a whole raft of suspense and things like that. So it's hard for them not to use that. But I think, I think, I, I haven't seen any examples of that. Of the glorification? Yeah, of the glorification. The Scott Newman Foundation also honored episodes of Cagney and Lacey, Love Boat, and Happy Days for portraying the prevention of drug abuse. Dick Shoemaker, Entertainment Tonight. Daily Variety reports today that Tony Thomopoulos will resign as president of the ABC Broadcast Group before the end of the year. ABC refuses to comment on the story. ABC News will cut its close-up documentary staff of 36 by at least one-third. And CBS laid off 40 employees in its records division. Entertainment Tonight senior correspondent Rona Barrett has learned the main beneficiaries of actor Rock Hudson's estate will be Mark Miller, his longtime secretary, and actor George Nader, Hudson's fellow contract player at the beginning of their respective careers. The estate, worth some $10 million, is now in trust. Tom Clark, Hudson's companion of 10 years, was cut out of the will when their friendship ended a few years ago. However, sources indicate Miller and Nader plan to include Clark in the proceeds from the sale of the estate. Newlywed Joan Collins, married Wednesday night in Las Vegas, was out on the town in Hollywood three nights later without her husband, but with an explanation for Gene Wolfe. Congratulations. Thank you. Well, how do you like married life so far? Pretty good. My husband's got the flu. That's why I'm with Jeffrey. I did that. It's wonderful. Well, people talk about the difference between being together with someone for a long time and then that decision to be married. What made you decide to do it right then? I changed my mind. This is everybody has the prerogative to do. Here's the ET Digest from Monday, the 11th of November. In the record store, Christmas present from the Statler Brothers and Ice on Fire from Elton John. In the bookstore, Shirley and Warren by James Spada. In concert, John Cougar Mellencamp at Roberts Municipal Stadium in Evansville, Indiana. And celebrating birthdays today, Philip McKeon is 21, Demi Moore is 23, Jonathan Winters is 60, and Stubby K, 67. Coming up next, high concept movies. The search is on in Hollywood. And ahead, Matt Dillon. He's made the transition from teen to young adult actor. One of Hollywood's most popular catchphrases, in addition to let's take lunch and the checks in the mail, it's high concept. Gene Wolfe explains. It's like a steam bath in here. It's okay, folks. It's uh, just a little steam, nothing to be alarmed about. This is Stewardess School, a movie that offers exactly what the title suggests. Stewardess School, the title, is obviously a comedy. It's an entertaining film. It's, you know, it's, uh, it's not Chekhov. Stewardess School is what Hollywood likes to call a high concept movie. 
made from an idea that can be quickly described and easily sold, first to a studio and then to an audience. High concept is basically an idea that can be told in 15 seconds or less and sounds very exciting, very hot, very high. The man responsible for Stewardess School is Ken Blancato, a writer and first-time director whose background is in advertising movies. If you could say a movie in one sentence, you could certainly advertise in a 30-second commercial. It makes life a lot easier. The success of Police Academy makes it easy to see why high-concept ideas are attractive to studios. The first two Police Academy films grossed a total of nearly $140 million. And now, Police Academy 3 is in production for release next spring. Studio executives could see early on the saleability of the Police Academy idea. High-concept movie ideas can be helpful to a studio when it comes to marketing a film. But high-concept doesn't necessarily mean low art. High-concept could be a sophisticated tootsie, case in point. It's about a man putting on a dress. That's a high concept. Ghostbusters, brilliant high concept movie. Back to the Future, uh, the same thing. I think a high concept movie is just, just right from the opening bell. You pretty much know what you're in for. Studios may rely so heavily on the comfort and ease of marketing high concept movies that other movies could have trouble getting made. Disney's The Journey of Natty Gann wasn't high concept enough for most studios. This picture was was turned down by every major studio. Uh, we tried to get financing in every nook and cranny available. And basically the response was, beautiful screenplay, hard to market. Some filmmakers, like the makers of the futuristic drama Brazil, have made a conscious decision to resist the easy route of high concept. One of the points of making a film like this was to make a film that was not describable in one neat little sentence because that seems to be the the way of, of uh, commercial filmmaking more and more i mean you have one quick sentence that you can then tell the world about and if it's a good sentence you then decide to make a film about it you, you work out you work it backwards what will sell the best then we go back from that to the film <coughs> my contacts that high-concept idea that the studios eagerly buy should perhaps best be viewed as merely a starting point in the lengthy filmmaking process. I think the ideal is, is that if you could take a structure that will fit what the studio's like, and, and they say, okay, make this film, and then once you got that, then make the best one you possibly can, and hopefully transcend the genre a little bit, you know, maybe a lot. Gene Wolfe, Entertainment Tonight. Silent screen star Mary McLaren, who starred opposite Douglas Fairbanks Sr. and Rudolph Valentino, died in Hollywood over the weekend. She was 85. McLaren's first job as an entertainer was in 1915 in an Al Jolson stage show. The highlight of her career coming six years later when she starred in the film The Three Musketeers with Fairbanks. And Academy Award-winning costume designer Helen Rose has died at her Palm Springs home following a long illness. She was 81. Rose designed costumes for more than 200 films. She was nominated 10 times for an Oscar and won twice for The Bad and the Beautiful and I'll Cry Tomorrow. Rose designed the cat dress for Elizabeth Taylor in Cat on a Hot Tin Roof. Off screen, she made the wedding gown for the 1956 marriage of Grace Kelly to Prince Rainier. A grown-up role for one of Hollywood's biggest teen stars, Matt Dillon. That story and more when we return. A play called The Boys of Winter, starring Matt Dillon and Andrew McCarthy, has had its Broadway opening postponed because of, quote, creative reasons. The play was to have opened next Sunday night. No new date has been announced. But another Matt Dillon project did take flight this weekend. It's a film called Target. Dixie Watley talked to the young actor about his latest, most grown-up role. We're not talking tourists here. We're talking about Mom. And I know you. You don't drink unless you're nervous. Matt Dillon has virtually grown up on screen. First cast at 14, Dillon has made the transition from adolescent to young man in films like Tex, Rumblefish, and his latest, Target. No one has monitored his progress more closely than Dillon himself. I mean, I'm a nitpicker. I'm going to pick at every little thing that I did wrong. I'm going to keep kicking myself, you know. One thing even Dillon would agree he did right was to team up with Gene Hackman. Together, they play a father and son searching not only for a missing mother, but also for each other. In this thing, my, me and my father, we don't really even have the same sense of humor, you know, in Hawaii. I mean, we don't, we just don't deal with each other. Where are you going? 
Paris. I have a passport and I have some money. If anyone has to go, I'll go. Nobody can wait that long. Hackman has said that he was able to establish a real good personal relationship with you, partly because he has a son your same age. Actually, to be honest with you, there are aspects of Gene that do remind me of my father. Very much. Very much so. Like what? Uh, I could never tell you. It's something that you, you sort of grow up with that. Actually, to be honest with you, he's got a bad knee like my father. That's what it is. <laughs> that explains it all. <laughs> Gene Hackman not only has Target in the theaters, he's also starring in Twice in a Lifetime. And Leonard Maltin is here with a review. You know what I really like? I like when a movie wins me over. Now, I thought I had Twice in a Lifetime all figured out. After a couple of scenes, I said to myself, I've seen all this before. Well, I was wrong. Gene Hackman plays a middle-aged man whose marriage has become routine and boring. Then he meets Anne Margaret, a widow, and has a fling with her. They fall in love, but after a confrontation with Hackman's wife and daughter, even she has doubts about their relationship. Look, we get a kick out of life again. God, is it worth it? Is it worth it? I don't think it's just a couple of kids. What do you mean, is it worth it? Of course it's worth it. Don't make me try to analyze this. I mean, what we got, we got to grab in our two hands. Be grateful for it. And be grateful for actors like Gene Hackman. He's so good, so real. And he's surrounded by other good actors, especially Ellen Burstyn as the devastated wife. And Amy Madigan, who sets off electric shocks as the daughter who refuses to accept her father's decision. I like this movie. I like watching believable characters, people I care about. Each of Hackman's three kids reacts to what he does in a different way. And it's that kind of insight that makes this film so good. Bud Yorkin wrote and directed the film, and I've got to admit, he surprised me. Twice in a Lifetime is a lot better than I thought it was going to be, and I'm giving it an eight. I'm Leonard Maltin, Entertainment Tonight. Three new movies opened around the country this weekend, and Movie Track was there to get ticket buyers' reactions. Audiences on both coasts gave Target two stars out of a possible four. According to Movie Track, the film is drawing the wrong crowd, the older male Gene Hackman fans rather than the young Matt Dillon devotees. If they were hoping to get teenage mileage out of Dillon, they miscalculated. Movie Track reports Target misses by a mile and with its week opening predicts a two to three week life. That was then. This is now also polled two stars. Movie Track's prediction for the film is not good and adds the movie is aimed at younger women who adore Emilio Estevez, a segment of the audience which does not create hits. Movie Track predicts that was then. This is now will be in theaters for only three or four weeks. Transylvania 6 5000 was given one star by ticket buyers on both coasts. Movie Track says that crowds were okay, but getting an audience for more than two weeks for Transylvania 6 5000 will be like getting blood from a stone. Only 2% rated at the very best, and 14% loved it, 29% liked it, while 45% said they were disappointed, and 10% said the movie was a bomb. The short and tall of it is TV's Webster lends a helping hand to the New York Knicks. That story and more when we come back. Coming up this week on Entertainment Tonight, tomorrow, Diane Carroll. Wednesday, John James. Thursday, Jack Lemon. And Friday, Peter Strauss. All this week, all on Entertainment Tonight. This weekend, Mary was on assignment in Fort Worth, Texas to interview Barry Manilow. This weekend was also Mary's birthday. 23rd again, wasn't it, Mary? Again. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What Mary didn't know was that Manilow and the 12,000 fans at the Tarrant Convention Center had a little surprise in store. So turn the lights on. Let's sing happy birthday to Mary, okay? Now just stand here and be beautiful. Ready? One, two, three, go. Thanks, sir. Standing room only. It was a total surprise. And you know what? All 12,000 of those people in Fort Worth sang beautifully. Great. Yeah. It was a lot of fun. Anyway, well, you'll be seeing that uh, interview that we actually did, more of Barry Manilow's music, in a couple of weeks on Entertainment This Week. Meantime, 
Emmanuel Lewis, TV's littlest star, went to New York to offer some tips to Patrick Ewing, basketball's biggest new star. Unfortunately, the results didn't match up to expectations. Saturday night, the New York Knicks were still trying to win their first game of the season, and this time the management had a secret weapon ready. Emmanuel Lewis was in uniform and working out at Madison Square Garden, thanks to the Knicks after rookie star Patrick Ewing appeared in an upcoming episode of Webster. The high point of the evening came when Lewis, he's the one in the middle, tossed up the ball to start the game. Having Lewis in a Knicks jersey and cheering on the sidelines didn't help. The Knicks lost again, and the star of Webster decided to lead the court to his friend, Ewing. He's pretty good, so I think I'll let him take care of that department. <laughs> <laughs> okay, tomorrow on Entertainment Tonight, a controversial episode of Helltown, plus interviews with Dynasty's Diane Carroll and Emilio Estevez. Today, of course, is Veterans Day, and there's one song every veteran can identify with. Its composer, Irving Berlin, performed it in 1943 film, This is the Army. See you tomorrow. I've been a soldier quite a while, and I would like to state The life is simply wonderful, the army food is great I sleep with 97 others in a wooden hut I love them all, they all love me, it's very lovely, but Oh, how I hate to get up in the morning Oh, how I'd love to remain in bed for the hardest blow of all is to hear the bugler call. You gotta get up, you gotta get up, you gotta get up this morning. Someday I'm going to murder the bugler. Someday they're going to find him dead. I'll amputate his reveille and step upon it heavily and spend the rest of my life in bed. A fun-filled half hour of fortune and prizes is coming your way next on The Price is Right with host Tom Kennedy here on Channel 6. And then I'll get that other pup, the guy who wakes the bugler up. And then...